Welcome everybody to lecture two. In this lecture, we're going to be using, uh, talking about the methods that social psychologists use to conduct their research. And methodology is not necessarily the most favorite topic for students. To be completely honest, it's also not my favorite talk topic to talk about, but it is an essential topic because only if we really understand what you need to do to conduct good research, you can also understand the outcomes of that research. And that is where the fun happens. That's where it gets exciting. So today we're going to be talking about the methods that social psychologists use to do their work. And um, especially for social psychology, you could say this is really important. It's an important to talk about good methodology. And why is this the case? Well, because um, it's not really easy to be a social psychologist, not in general, but also not, especially not over uh, the last uh, decade. Let me talk, t uh, talk to you about why um, this is uh, it's problematic to be a social psychologist and the problems that we tend to run into. The first problem has to do with the image of social psychology. The second one about bad research practices. And finally, unethical research that ha has been conducted in the past. Um, so let me start off with the first one, the image of social psychologists. Okay, so let's start by talking about the image uh, that uh, social psychologists uh, have. The image is typically that social psychology is just common sense. It's sort of an open door. The research that we do is not really new. It's something that we, uh, all humans can sort of predict the outcomes. It's not very important, therefore. And let me tell you a little bit about my own research and the, the sort of the problems that I had when talking about uh, my work. So I told you before that I study relationships. And uh, when I did my, uh, my PhD, um, I studied why some people are better able to maintain and protect their relationships than others. And one topic that I studied was cheating. So unfaithfulness in relationships. And I studied why some people are more likely to cheat on their partner than others. And um, there's, of course, a variety of topics, and it's a very complex question. Um, but one factor that I zoomed into was impulse control. So in my work, I studied participants' ability to control their impulses. And I tested whether this ability for impulse control predicted cheating. So whether people with, that are very impulsive are actually more likely to cheat on their partner. And I thought it, this was very cool research. And I think I did some very cool studies. And it was in the media. And then I got a lot of remarks from people saying, yes, of course, but this makes so much sense. Why would anyone study this? You just, if you're impulsive, you're likely to cheat. So yeah, what's, what's the big deal? You know, everybody knows this. And this is a typical uh, example of what we refer to as hindsight bias. Hindsight bias is uh, basically the idea that you, um, uh, once you know the results of a certain study, you think it would have been very easy to predict it. So retrospectively, you think once you know how something works, you think I could have easily predicted this. So this is called hindsight bias. And social psychologists have a lot of troubles with this because a lot of times if they talk about their work, people say, yeah, I knew this all along. That's basically the idea of hindsight bias. This is not new information. This is just research being conducted on something that everybody already knows. And sometimes I get it, this feedback, this criticism, but oftentimes this is not how it works. Because if I ask you to predict outcomes of a certain study, this is much more complicated than you sometimes uh, think. So, um, for example, I will now uh, showcase some, some, some questions, something that you could study. Uh, for example, you hear a song on the radio for the very first time. You really like the song. Over the next few weeks, you hear it many, many, many times on the radio. So you know this, first time you hear a song, then you, it's got repeated over and over and over and over and over again. After a couple of weeks, do you think you will like the song less, the same, or more? So you think about it yourself. Another example. Taro, who happens to be my oldest son, and this is actually something that happened to me. Uh, Taro is playing in his room. Um, his room is a bit messy and he decides out of his own initiative, which is shocking as a mom, I can say that he, sh he decides to clean his room. Uh, and actually, to his own surprise, he also enjoys doing so. Um, when his mother later enters the room, she decides to reward him with five euros. 
Um, and after this payment, do you think Taro will like the act of cleaning his room even more, the same or less? So once he was rewarded for the behavior, do you think this increased his liking for cleaning the room, or do you think it didn't affect it, or do you think he liked it less? So uh, you might have some uh, ideas about this, uh, and I can tell you that probably your first responses to these questions are wrong. I'm not going to tell you the answers to these questions right now. You will learn them if you follow this course. So stay tuned for the answers on, to these questions. But they are less straightforward than you think. Um, so this is sort of the first problem that uh, we as social psychologists uh, uh, deal with, uh, the problem that uh, we have this image that is our research is an open door, it's not important, everybody can predict it, which is oftentimes not the case because of hindsight bias. Okay, on to the second uh, problem that we social psychologists face. This is actually a tougher cookie, I would say. And this is something that has uh, become very uh, open and relevant over the last 10 years, and it had to do a lot with something that happened at Tilburg. Actually, to be more specific, at the Department of Social Psychology of Tilburg University. It had to do with this guy that you see over here. I don't know if you know him. Maybe some people recognize him. His name is Diederik Stapel. And Diederik Stapel was very well known in the field of social psychology, really a very influential scholar, someone who published a lot of papers, also got published in very big um, uh, journals like Science, like then you really made it if you published in Science and in Nature. Um, so he was well known, very famous, um, and uh, he also was the dean uh, of the faculty uh, at a certain uh, moment. And just to give you an, uh, an impression of his sort of his fame, uh, while I was doing my PhD research, I started in 2006 and it, I ended in, in 2010. Um, what you do as a PhD student, if, once you're finished and you wrote your dissertation, you send it out to influential people in the field. And I also remember that I sent a copy of my dissertation to Diederik Stapel and he sent me an email and it was just one sentence, something like, I don't remember it word by word, but it was something like, uh, thanks for your dissertation, very interesting work. And that really made my day because he was so famous, he was so well known, and I thought, wow, he actually got my dissertation and, uh, and uh, sent me an email about it. So this, that's, that's sort of the level of fame that he had in our own field and also more broadly speaking in society because he was also in the news quite a lot with his work, uh, really sort of groundbreaking work also, also very influential, impactful. Um, the media really liked his work. For example, he, had, he did a study together uh, with Roos Funk of uh, uh, Rappert University in Nijmegen, in which uh, they compared people who eat meat uh, versus vegetarians, and that people who eat meat uh, would be uh, basically more, uh, more of an asshole once you eat meat. So you, you become sort of a a worse person, your personality is, is worse when, uh, if you uh, eat meat. Uh, so this was also something that was in the news a lot, sort of very appealing. So everything was going very well for Professor Stapel until uh, uh, in 2011, um, there were some uh, students in his group uh, who uh, had their concerns about the way he worked. And there was, uh, they were very brave and they s stepped up and they raised their concerns to people uh, in power. And as it turns out, he was actually uh, conducting fraud at a very, very big uh, level. So he actually now is known as one of the biggest scientist frauds in the history. So um, he um, sort of used all the bad research practices that you can think of. And uh, most importantly, he sort of made up his own data. So he would say that he uh, conducted a certain study. For example, he said he, he conducted studies with primary school children. Uh, and what he actually did was he himself, in the back of his car, filled out questionnaires as it was, as it is, was filled out by the children and conducted his research based on the questionnaires that he himself filled out. Can you imagine how scandalous that is? It's, it's really bizarre. So there was a huge investigation, and, and uh, it turned out that a lot of his papers, also the famous meat-eating versus vegetarian paper, was completely false. It was not based on, on, on uh, fraudulent, faked data. And a lot of his uh, work, actually almost all of his work, was retracted also from these big uh, articles uh, like uh, Science. Uh, they retracted uh, the paper. 
And it was really a serious investigation also uh, because he got a lot of money to conduct his work. So he got millions and millions of euros to conduct his work and he spent it on you know, hiring people and, and making money himself. Um, and he also ruined so many careers for PhD students of his. Um, yeah, it's really, it was really, really bad. So um, also, of course, not good for Tilburg, not good for the reputation of social psychology, especially not social psychology in Tilburg. Complete disaster. But this turns out to be only the tip of the iceberg. Because in the years to come, we sort of, as a field, uh, reconsidered the methods that we use to do our work. And we found out that there's actually a lot of you know, bad research practices. And fraud is <laughs> very apparent, one of them. But there are more problems with, with doing science. Uh, for example, using very small sample sizes, so not enough participants, basically, to come up with your conclusions. And sort of removing participants from your data set and then conducting your analysis. So if you want to know more about that, I will post a link so you can read on the seven deadly sins of uh, methodology and social psychology. It's not relevant for you to know all of this, but if you're interested, you can find out more. Uh, for now, it's just enough for you to know that there were bad research practices and this sort of spurged um, an entire field of replication, replication studies. And what replication means is that uh, researchers sort of redo work that has been done in the past. So especially very famous studies that have, have been very well known, uh, these uh, studies were replicated, uh, repeated basically, uh, by other researchers using oftentimes a bigger uh, group of participants, a different sample size, and to see whether the same results could be obtained. And um, what uh, the researchers found out was that oftentimes results could not be replicated. So when, when the study was repeated, other results were obtained, which is a problem. Because if you obtain other results than the results that was in the initial work, then the conclusions that, was, uh, that, that people come up with from the uh, previous work yeah, cannot actually be uh, concluded. So you have to change the theory. So this is called a replication science, a replication crisis, sorry. And this has also been uh, uh, discussed a lot. So there's a lot of uh, examples of replication crisis um, in the field of social psychology, but it turns out to be a much broader problem. It was also general in other fields of psychology, but also in... Um, for example, medicine uh, and other uh, fields of science, uh, there was a replication crisis. So we needed to sort of step up our game, change our methods to make sure that uh, the conclusions that we derive from our work can actually, you know, are real, are based on actual uh, factual information. So we are now, uh, after a decade or so after this crisis, we are moving further, we're moving forward, and we are improving our methods. So I think social psychologists did very well in taking this crisis very serious and changing stuff for the better. So what we did now is um, we run replication studies, as I mentioned, so we sort of uh, repeat studies that have been done in the past, but then with better methods. We also run meta-analyses, and with a meta-analysis, you sort of combine several researches, so several studies um, that had the same goal to see whether uh, the results um, uh, are still true. So basically, you, you combine studies uh, to test whether uh, a certain hypothesis uh, can actually be uh, uh, um, confirmed, yes or no. Uh, and finally, we now uh, conduct open science practices, and this is really supported. And with open science, I mean that we, for example, once we uh, come up with a research question and we have um, a certain expectation, we pre-register pre this. And this means that we, uh, before we actually do the research, we type and we, we make public uh, our expectation of that work. So this is called pre-registration. Uh, the materials that we use are open and the data sets are open. So everybody can just look into what we did. So the chances of actually conducting fraudulent work, that's really slim because now everything is so open. So it's very hard for a future Diederik Stapel to do what he did. So I think we did a very good job in this. Um, so... This is solved, right? <laughs> of course, this is still work in the making, but this is, this is going the right direction. Now, let's move on to the final problem that we as social psychologists uh, have to deal with. And this is, uh, has to do with um, unethical research. And uh, what you see here are uh, pictures 
um, of uh, studies that was actually conducted by um, uh, social psychologists. You, you see a very famous study, the Milgram experiment and the uh, Zimbardo experiment. These were both conducted around the 60s and the 70s. I'm not going to talk about the content of this research. I'm going to do so later in the course, so I'm going to tell you all about what this researchers actually did. But for now, I just want to mention that the research was conducted as very renowned institutions like Stanford University, still one of the most renowned worldwide, well-known uh, institutions for science, uh, also by very well-known professors um, in uh, psychology. Uh, Zimbardo and Milgram were well-respected and they conducted studies that were completely unethical. And uh, they, could, they should have never been conducted because the participants were really harmed in this work. And what they exactly did, again, I will tell you, but we are still dealing with sort of the backlash of this research because uh, these studies are still very famous, maybe you already know them, uh, and they also damage the image that we have as social psychologists, and they also damage the perspective that, that we are sort of messing, messing with people a little bit. Uh, so this is also something that we need to change. Um, and we are also moving forward in this uh, regard. So when it comes to ethics uh, of research, we have very, uh, very good restrictions, I think, now. So, for example, uh, we use informed consent. So, and that means that once participants enter our research, the very first thing they do is they read an information letter in which we explain to them what this research is about and what they can expect. And uh, they, they give consent, so they say, okay, I understand it, and I agree to participate in this work. Sounds very straightforward, right? But this is new, relatively new in the field of science. So to actually tell people what they can expect and not just bombard them with uh, some, some sort of uh, research pr procedure that they didn't see coming, so they now know what they are getting themselves into. Informed consent is a really vital uh, aspect of ethics. Uh, we try to avoid deception, sounds very logical, right? But for a long time, a lot of research that has been uh, conducted in, in psychology uh, used deception, so we basically lied to participants. Uh, for example, we, um, what, what researchers did in the past was we gave participants a task to do. This was really a, you know, a task that didn't make any sense, they had to count something or divide something. And then we gave them fake feedback. And the fake feedback could, for example, look like this. Uh, on the basis of the results of your task, I can see that in the end of your life, you will have no friends. You will die all alone and everybody will leave you. Well, that's quite harsh feedback, right? And that was all, you know, nonsense. It was not true. But it was used to sort of shock participants and see what the effect is of, of receiving this feedback and, and studying emotions. Well, that's maybe the researchers had good intentions. But using deception can actually harm participants because this is something that can stick with you, especially if participants are later on not informed that was, this was actually fake, something that I'll come back to later. So we try to avoid deception. We also try to protect our participants, protect them from, from experiencing harm, pain, being too cold, being too hot, you know, making sure that they are not harmed. Uh, sometimes we do harm them a little bit just to see the, ex the, the results. Uh, but then it will be, you know, within a very uh, doable range. I'll give you some examples of that later on in the course. But we try to protect the participants as good as we can. Uh, also, of course, confidentiality, uh, confidentiality is now a much, much of a more big deal. So we protect the privacy of our uh, participants, uh, especially relevant today, because once something is, you know, out there, you, you cannot imagine sort of them personal questions we sometimes ask our participants and we wa really want to make sure that these data are treated confidential so we are uh, using more restrictions on that regard. And finally, um, we uh, also uh, use debriefing and debriefing is at the very end of an experiment. We tell participants uh, what the research was about and also if we still used deception, for example, so we gave them fake feedback, we really make sure that they know that this was false and this is you know, it's not based on real actual uh, data. And to make sure that we do all this correctly, there's now an IRB, this is an institutional re review board um, at basically every university that uh, sort of checks whether the research that is conducted also lives up to these expectations. So we have s several institutions in place to make sure that researchers uh, do their job well both when it comes to conducting right methodology, as well as when it comes to treating people in a humane way. Thanks.